stage of incapacity. Incapacity to reform, neither politically nor economically. And some of us last year proposed the National Transition Authority as that which might, for a period of two years, provide the space through which reform would take place before the next elections. Well, it was shot down. And uh, even though what has happened the last two weeks made it even more imperative that such a, a transition authority should be put in place. The more serious implications, of course, are these, that what does this mean uh, given the reform agenda on the political front? What is, what is the objective of the Constitution? What is the objective of reform, political reform? The objective of political reform, to put it very simply, is to establish a democratic governance structure in which there's a separation of powers between a, an accountable executive, a vibrant legislature, and a fiercely independent judiciary. That, in short, describes the democratic order. Now, we have a situation now where the military, which is part of the executive, or is under the executive, is in reality above the executive, above the constitution, whether the one likes it or not, notwithstanding all the niceties that have gone about it. That's a major challenge, and in particular, given that the new president has made it clear that there will be elections, seven months ahead, some, of, some people have hoped that a national transitional authority or a government of national unity would necessarily mean a, def, a, a, a postponement of elections for two to three years. Clearly, that is not the plan. Elections are on. So, what kind of elections are you going to have? As someone suggested, you might end up having command elections. <laughs> And it's not a, 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 an inane remark. If we remember, we seem to have a very short memory. The real coup took place in 2008. Someone won elections. 24 hours later, Mugabe had conceded, by the way. 24 hours later, it was reversed. And we said then already that the military was in ascendance, as if it had ever been on the decline. And the events of the last few weeks has taught us something, at least those of us who were briefly in Maputo, that the military has been supreme in the history of modern Zimbabwe. Even the Rhodesian days, the army was supreme. The military. In the liberation movement, especially in, in ZANU, those of us who have to know that Tonga Gara was the most powerful man, notwithstanding the claim by uh, Mugabe and others that the politics directs the gun, the reality has been otherwise. We came in in 1980, we thought maybe now, under the new democratic order, the, the politicians had taken over from the army, but no. The Rex Mujuru remained powerful, led up almost until his death in 2011. And clearly, General, General Chwenga has been very supreme ever since 2008. And therefore the claim that uh, the, the politicians were in control of the army has been proved wrong, even for those of us who had argued otherwise. So we have this political challenge of reform, and of a free and fair elections under a military supremacy. But secondly, there is the issue of economic reforms. And it appears, at least from the extent to which the international community, who appear, at least some of them, to have been part of this process. <laughs> uh, you saw ministers flying in 
I thought the one when it was, it was almost like April 2018, 1980, when Prince Charles came in to hand over the flag. It was almost like that. But I'm also told the congressman from the U.S. was here over the weekend. So there's everyone, and significantly no one has used the word coup. So, others would argue that these are grand opportunities. Boris Johnson yesterday was making all kinds of announcements. Enough to suggest that those plans must have been afoot at least a year ago, if not two years ago. So here we are. I have digressed a little just to give a, a bit of background. And as I said, the theme here tonight is uh, challenges and opportunities. I have a very able panel, but before I introduce them, I wanted to just uh, a special work, welcome to uh, comrade here from South Africa, Kapini Sebidi. Uh, he was here in exile in the 80s from the um, Konto. And uh, we, as we do, we know, send our notices everywhere to all our network. And he felt, he forced all, to the extent this, this might inform South Africa. Uh, I was joking with him that uh, I called somebody last week that we were building a wall at the Limpopo. And someone said, oh, great, great idea. We're tired of you Zimbos here. <laughs> and I said, no, it's to keep you out. <laughs> so welcome, Ben. Welcome. Yes. I will introduce each of the panelists as we go. So I will ask uh, Ashok, a regular uh, panelist, a shareholder here, major shareholder, to begin. Uh, Ashok is an economist. But more important, a few months ago he joined the, the office of the president uh, in, the, in the ease of doing business section to try and make Zimbabwe more attractive for investment. But Ashok has been here a number of times to warn us about the imperative of economic reform and I'm hoping that he would particularly address himself to the issue of economic reform uh, possibilities and the opportunities that arise thereof. Ashok. Thank you, Ibo. Thank you. Um, well, good evening, and many of you have heard me before, so I think that uh, what you're going to hear today is probably not very different. And so I'm uh, what I'm going to say today is not very different, so I'm sorry to disappoint you about that. Um, in terms of the issues confronting our economy, um, really nothing has changed. So if I spoke to you two or three months ago about the structural problems that confront Zimbabwe, then we are very much in the same situation. Um, the problems are still there and they have to be dealt with. I think the difference now is that, um, that I sense um, is that whereas uh, with the previous government, with the previous government, um, there were um, limited efforts at reform, which were uh, ongoing at various levels, um, but there was no real commitment from the top uh, to actually pushing the agenda in and actually uh, um, in the implementation of many of the um, you know, processes and laws and regulatory changes that were being agreed to at lower levels. So I think that has significantly changed even in the last few days. Um, the problems remain the same. I think that whereas we had something like a lid on top of us in terms of the ability to deal with issues, that seems to have been taken away. Um, I think um, it was very positive, the, the meeting that uh, the President had with the permanent secretaries. And uh, you will find that even, uh, I'll give you an example, just a couple of months, uh, about a month ago, the Office of the President sent a circular to all the ministries talking about parastatal reform and privatization and requesting information about whether there were any parastatals under their jurisdiction which could be considered for privatization or joint ventures, or in fact, as the ex-president said, to be buried. Um, and uh, surprisingly, there, there was not a single response 
from any of the ministries. Now we have 114 parastatals. They hold a total of $14 billion in capital, dead capital. Only one or two of them make a profit. So it was remarkable that none of the ministries wanted to come forward even to talk about what to do with any of them. And all of them require subventions from the budget, which add up to Simba, probably will be able to advise us better, but um, in the region of four to five hundred million dollars. Now, things like that have certainly changed, and um, I think that we are going to see a lot more movement in a number of areas. Um, so I can only talk about economic reform. I'm just going to highlight a couple of issues and talk about potential solutions which are likely to, we're likely to see going forward. So when I've spoken in the past and um, also what the IMF and the World Bank and others have been saying is our primary problem has been the size of government, uh, the level of government, high level of government expenditure and the extremely large deficit. Last year we had a deficit of $1.4 billion and this year we were looking at, we are looking at probably in the range of 1.7 to 1.8 billion dollars. So we're talking of almost three and a half billion dollars in deficit financing in the last three years. And when we compare that to the, de the deposit base in the country, which is currently around seven billion dollars, that's all our deposits in the banking system, you will then realize why most of it is virtual money because it was all electronically created through deficit financing and pumped into the banking system. So the dollars that are held in the banking system are not real dollars at all. They're electronic virtual dollars and have been so for some time. Now on the deficit, um, unless we control the deficit, all other things that we talk about are going to be peripheral because that is the fundamental source of our problems on the economic front. Um, that's the cause of inflation. That's the cause of pressure on the balance of payments, that's the cause of pressure on imports, and that is the primary reason for our liquidity crisis. Because when you have a dollarized economy, it's not possible to have deficit financing. You have to have a budget which is balanced. So all these things have come because of the deficit, and the indications are that at least we are moving in, hopefully we will move in the right direction. The budget is going to be is come out on the 7th of December and um, hopefully the budget will show at least in concrete terms some of the measures that uh, indicate the intent of the government to address this particular issue. Now some of the easy things that can be considered within, of course the largest part of the budget is wages and salaries, but given as Ibo has said we are going towards an election in August or July, August next year. Um, it's very unlikely that the whole question of wages and salaries will be addressed. Employment is a politically difficult issue and I don't really see um, the government having the ability to be able to cut employment costs. On the other hand, there are other areas which are easier targets um, within the budget. Allowances, for instance. Uh, we've always had a problem with allowances. Travel allowances have been very huge. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more feasible, for instance, for the Ministry of Finance to put specific ceilings on travel allowances and be strict about it, and to control other allowances as well. So that's one, one area which I'm hopeful about. The other area I've already mentioned, and that's the parastatals. I think that we are going to see a lot more movement on the parastatals. Um, that might take some time, but nevertheless, um, I don't see any reason why ministries that are holding on to non-essential parastatals which do not um, uh, contribute to essential services, why they should not just tell them that they are not going to be supported anymore. And um, why they should not be supported anymore and that there should be no more subventions from the Ministry of Finance or the budget. Um, so they will have to go through either a process of privatization, joint ventures or liquidation as the case may be. So I'm a lot more hopeful in terms of the deficit being issued, uh, being, be, being looked at more seriously uh, going forward. It's not going to be something that can happen overnight, but at least we have the possibility that that is something that, that can be looked at. Now, in terms of generally the uh, question of investment and uh, the President has emphasized the question of jobs, well, you can't create jobs unless you have investment. And um, as we all accept, Zimbabwe is a highly over-regulated economy and has been so for some time. 
and it has to go through a, a, a strong process of deregulation. Um, now, the ease of doing business agenda in which I have been involved has been part of that deregulation process, but uh, there hasn't been the political will to push it through, and we really have not had the cooperation of the regulators and the ministries in putting, putting through that agenda. I think going forward, there's going to be a lot more happening on that front. We're going to see a lot more deregulation. Uh, we're going to, uh, in various sectors of the economy, we're going to see a much more business-friendly en um, environment coming up. Um, in, on the investment side, there are a number of things which need to be closely looked at. We've, uh, the Indigenization Act always has been problematic. Um, and I'm glad to see that uh, some senior people of well, some senior war veterans, I'd say, Colonel Dubey, for instance, spoke yesterday about the fact that the Indigenization Act should just be done away with. So I think that even if it's not done away with, it should certainly be revised to uh, in a manner which makes it investor friendly. Um, so if we start dealing with the regulations, the regulatory environment, um, improve the enabling environment for business, deal with laws such as indigenization.